Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. Today we continue what we started last week, reaching out to old acquaintances and friends currently living off-island just to reaffirm that during this time of social distancing and quarantine, we are still one, Marianas. And our guest today is a Peace Corps volunteer who was here from 1968 to 1970. And uh, we chatted with him via WhatsApp, so I do apologize. The audio quality isn't as good as usual, but it's still a conversation worth sharing. Our guest today, all the way from New Mexico, is Mr. John Whitbeck. John, how are you guys doing there in New Mexico? Great. And half a day to you also. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting, of course, and, and uh, we're in this whole you know shelter-in-place stuff, and... So on a state level, so far we've had over a thousand cases. We've had about a hundred people within the state pass away. You have individuals who obviously are not following the requirements. They're not wearing masks. They're not maintaining the distances they need. They don't wear gloves. People are not either not able to, or they're not for whatever reason. They're not really following. They don't. They can't get their head around how serious this is. Well, it's really great that, um, in a sense, people are kind of stuck at home because, see, we found you, and now we can uh, talk story with you. How is it you came to join the Peace Corps and oh, I, end up in Saipan? I grew up uh, on a small farm in a rural area in Pennsylvania, and it was a great place to grow up because it was. I was out in nature. I mean. You know, I ran around in the woods in the summertime. We used to go to the swimming hole after we put in hay to wash off the hay seats, you know. Uh, and in winter, you could sled ride almost every day after school. So that's kind of how I grew up. And then uh, when I decided, when I finished high school, I felt that I wanted to uh, become a liberal arts major, that I wanted a more general education rather than to specialize in something. And there's a college, Allegheny College, which is close to where my home was. That's a well-known, uh, very reputable liberal arts school. So I went there. And this would be from uh, like 64 to 68. Um, and the things that were going on at that time, of course, is people becoming more involved in, okay. <laughs> uh, Oh, okay. So what was happening is that I became involved in like anti-war protests, and those kinds of things, and I decided that I wanted to experience a culture that's different. That I wanted one that I felt. Which one did I feel would be the most diverse from where I was currently? And that was I decided that was Saipan. I got accepted to go there. So that's why that's how I went. My interest when I got there was, what could I learn? You know, my my approach was, if you have a desire to learn, then maybe you'll get information that might be useful if you want to help other people. That there needs to be a kind of reciprocity between people when they are attempting to accomplish whatever goal they wish to do. It needs to be mutual, and that created a bit of conflict with me and the people who were doing the training, uh, you know, the thing was, well, you're in the Peace Corps, you're a volunteer 24 hours a day, and uh, so you have to be very busy because there's so much people need to learn from you. Well, what can I learn from others? So I wasn't sure they were going to keep me. <laughs> so what, they always deselect a few people. What exactly were your responsibilities while you were in Saipan? What were you helping with? Yes. Okay. So when I very first got there, they had Typhoon Gene. I was selected to teach at Mount Carmel, which turned out to be really fortunate for me. Uh, 
for a number of reasons. One, I think, was the way they approach education. But initially, when we first got there, the library had been completely destroyed, so we learned to use Dewey Decimal System while churches all over were sending books. The kids didn't have any books in the library. They'd all been destroyed and placed through them. So we wound up cataloging and reconstructing a new library for the students before the school year started. When the school year started, of course, we took the kids to Mass every morning, and then uh, I would be teaching. The classes I taught were called English 1 and English 4, and uh, it was a different curriculum there than it was in the public schools. The public schools expected you to teach English as a second language, and I was more into teaching writing and literature and stuff, which went well with my students. Also, uh, you had the... Uh, boarding school at the convent for girls from all over Micronesia, and I was the uh, choir director for these girls would come and we would practice after school in the uh, choir loft at the cathedral, and then they would sing for mass. So I was engaged in that thing. And other things, though, for example, uh, Dr. Miles was the Peace Corps doctor there. He's very interesting intelligent person. Um, he also happened to own a catamaran. <laughs> and his house was right across from mine while he was on the beach. So there's this catamaran. It's a hobby cat, was called. It was not a big catamaran. But he's a doctor. And so he's always busy, you know. I mean, he would be doing surgeries or whatever. He said, well, John, you know, if I don't have a chance to use the catamaran, you're welcome to use it. Well, one of my things that I did, I don't know if I could call it a responsibility, is I like to really spend time in the evenings going out <clears throat> offshore and then finding my, it depended of course on the time of year and what the tides were and so on, but there were times when I could go out past the reef where they used to travel to Sugar Dock. There's a phone reef there. And I could go out beyond the reef and I could sail that catamaran back and forth. And frequently, like, his son David would go with me or other people other people in the village would go with me. So I guess really what I spent a lot of my time doing was just doing things with people who were already living in the same village that I lived in. So I did teach tennis to kids at, uh, at the, uh, it was called... Uh, Royal was, Taga? Uh, the Royal Taga. The yeah. Royal Taga had a tennis court. Yeah. And that was fun. I, you know, it's like we had this living allowance of like $145 a month, right? And so it's called a living allowance, and they determined the amount based on the idea that we would have an equal amount of money that most of the quote-unquote host country nationalists had. In other words, they didn't want us to have a larger income than people that were there. Well, the truth of the matter was, for me, everywhere that I went... When you, whenever you went into someone's home, you always saw a rice cooker in the kitchen. And the rice cooker was typically had warm rice in it, or if they'd finished the rice, then you started another cooker of rice. And it didn't really matter what time of day it was. It wasn't like it was a breakfast, lunch, or dinner. When you visited someone, they said you. You know, there was sliced rice, maybe some fresh fish and some vegetables. So I never really had to buy food. <laughs> and then, of course, you had these fiestas and, and uh, things, you know, like there would be all these tables, folding tables, going all the way down Mount Carmel or the, outside the classrooms. And every table would have tons of food on it for different regions, whether it was a feast day or, I mean, a religious holiday or whether somebody got married or whatever, right? And those were quite amazing. And... It's just, the other thing that was interesting is whenever someone had a family, let's say a family had a marriage going on, well, other people donated for that marriage. They would donate different animals, whatever they needed. The food was donated because people shared everything. When you had that event happen, the bride or the bride's family had to make absolutely sure that they wrote down exactly what each person brought. Because if someone in that family went through the same process, you had to bring something of equal value that they'd given you. And, you know, 
the idea of ownership was not really something that was prevalent there. I mean, it's like people just cared what they had. So it's still I mean, very much like that, and that those traditions continue. You you mentioned yeah. about um, being out on the water, and you have a particular story actually with a local family about um, something that could have been very tragic that happened to you when you were out on the water. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and it also demonstrates how foolish I was at the time. But um, So within the village I lived in, there was a family, uh, the mother, the daughter, and two sons. The father was on a truck, and he had a business there. But anyhow, I got to know the family. In fact, the mother fed me frequently. So there was a guy who was on a German ship. It was an officer. It was like a tramp steamer. He jumped ship on Saipan, left the ship, and he's just kind of bumming around. And he said, do you guys know that is there a way we could get out to Managaha, you know, the little island off the shore? And we said, well, yeah, you know, you can swim out there. <laughs> so, <laughs> Wait, you guys actually used to swim out there? Oh, yeah. Whoa, okay. Well, it's not so, I mean, it's not that far. Managaha's not that far. Well, I guess we've had Anyhow. too much shore erosion here, but anyways, go ahead. Okay, so <laughs> so this guy said, oh, well, I really want to go. And it was like on a weekend or something. Well, it was like in August. It was like August 10th or something. So he said he knew somebody that would loan us a boat. We said, oh, okay, well, we'll go. So we met him in the morning at Sugar Dog. And the boat he was going to borrow was not available. And it was this little tiny boat. It was eight feet long. It had a three-horse engine on it. And we're going to use this to go out to Managa. And that day, the, the ocean was really particularly calm, you know. It was very nice, gentle. Uh, and so we're heading towards Managa. And, of course, now he's looking at Tinian. Now, if you're on Saipan and you look at Tinian, you're looking at the back side of Tinian. The harbor is on the other side of Tinian, right? He said, hey, you know what? He says, let's go back. He says, I'm going to get some cans of gas. And instead of going to get Anagaha, since we're past the reef, we can go to Tinian. We said, well, well okay. So, <laughs> so we went back and we got gas. And I think we got maybe like, I don't know, a case of beer or something to take with us. And so we headed out and we got past the reef. And now we're heading closer to Tinian. But between Tenian and Saipan, you have the uh, Philippine current. And so, because the, the water is squeezing between those two islands, it wants to pull you towards the Philippines. Well, the Philippines is much further than Tenian, right? <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> for us at that time, people typically tossed things they didn't want in off down by the airport, they would throw things off the reef or off the cliff into the water. So, sharks like to feed there, too. But anyhow, so here we are, we're heading, and now this is, uh, it's almost sundown, it's getting dark, and I'm sitting in the boat, Leo's at the front, I'm in the middle, and this guy's back with the motor, and we're cruising along, and I noticed that the, the back of the boat started sinking. I said, hey, look, you know, we're taking on water. So that was, I was surprised, yeah, <laughs> Anyhow, we sank, and they all stuck with me. This guy was 16 years old. He saved my life for over eight hours. And this was Leo Pangalinen, right? That's the family you're talking yes, about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leo was one of the students that came back to the States to finish school when I came back. And his son, is, when, I got, when I went back, it's interesting, because when Leo came with me to go to school here, I remember he's a young guy. He's going to finish two years of high school, and then he wants to go on to college. And we were sitting in front of my mother's house, and I remember very clearly, he was talking about how he wanted to finish college, and then he wanted to get married and have a family. And, you know, he went on, we went on our separate ways. All those years later, when I came back to Saipan, it was amazing. I mean, I landed on Saipan like at four in the morning. Leo's there. Of course, he doesn't look like he's 18 anymore, right? <laughs> he's a grandfather, you know? But... There, was, there he was, waiting for me at 4 o'clock in the morning. It's like the first time we'd reconnected in all those years. And I stayed with him for two weeks. And during that period of time, 
he was so gracious to me. And, you know, like his son was also named Leo, and his children would come over. And then Leo's brother, John, came over one time, and they would sit around Leo's house playing music and singing, you know, playing guitars. And it was just real, really, I, what, I, what, I, what I think Leo was so proud to show me, and he was very, uh, very reasonable for him to have that kind of pride, is, look, John, you know, I was a teenager, you helped me get an education, and I told you I wanted to get married and have a family. And he has a wonderful family, his, his son and his daughter, and, and, and their children and, and uh, the people they're married to. He has one son I didn't meet because he was in Washington or somewhere, but I think he's going back to site Ken now. But, yeah, it's like, you know, the Pangolins were accepted me in my mind as like being the older son or whatever. So there were the mother, the three children, two boys and a daughter, and then, you know, I spent time with them. Now, what what made you yeah. decide to come back a few years ago, and, and what, what were your impressions when you got here? Well, I had always wanted to go back, and, you know, in my sort of checkered career <laughs> financially, so, as I did different things. I said, you know, there's got to be a time in my life when I go back. And when I started getting close to 70, I said, this is the time. I'm not going to wait any longer. And I did. And it was really one of the best things for me because Leo died like about a year after I was there. And had he passed away and I'd never seen him again, just imagine. I mean, Marion was another person there who had stayed with my mother to go to school. Her name's Marion Pierce now. She was Marion all done at that time. And so she came back a year before I came back and stayed with my mother and went to high school in Pennsylvania. And then when Leo and I came back, of course, Leo and Marion were friends. And, and so I have a picture somewhere of Thanksgiving dinner with Marion and, and Leo and my mother and grandmother and myself. And, so, you know, those kinds of memories. But it was so interesting because I didn't know. I mean, I, I was communicating with Leo by email, and he was talking to me about things, and he mentioned at one point, and I knew that he his health was suffering when I was there. But at one point he said, yeah, he said, uh, I'm having some problems with my heart, and he said that I'm getting treatment. And his last email was, yeah, things are going pretty well. Well, then somehow I saw a message that Leo Pangolina had died. And I contacted Marion, and I said, Marion, is this a Leo that, is this Leo that passed away? And she said, yes. And, you know, but the one thing that she expressed to me is she said, you know, I know it's really painful to know that he's not here anymore. She said, but you're so fortunate that you guys, both of you are so fortunate that you could spend a couple weeks together before he passed on, and if he had passed on without my being able to do that, I, I mean, it's always painful to leave somebody, to lose somebody, but, uh, but I have that, to me it was fortuitous, <laughs> you know, to go back and be able to be there and spend time with Leo and other people that have been students and Albert and Marion and, of course, I found it was very, very different, you know, when I lived there, uh, you had, if you had a vehicle, it was either going to be a Dotson pickup or a Dotson sedan. <laughs> and, and, you know, traveling by vehicle <clears throat> was not that available to everyone. And you just had, like, one village after another going along the ocean, you know, along the, the beaches on that side of, of Saipan. And then, of course, if you went towards the interior, you went up Mount Takachau, which we... People there used to call it Mount Olympus <laughs> instead of Mount Dapachab for some rather obvious reasons in my mind. But anyhow, it's like, so your life was between villages, within villages, and then most families had some place where when you went back from the village towards into the jungle, you would have a piece of land where you could grow vegetables and stuff, and they would go there and do that frequently on a weekend. And everybody had a machete, you know, to keep cutting things back, otherwise... Tang and tang and everything would have overgrown your gardens quickly uh, because it was very persistent. Hmm. 
You said that uh, when you when uh, you came, one of the things you wanted to do was learn from other another culture. What do you feel your time yes. um, in the early days here in Saipan um, taught you, or how do you feel it influenced your life afterwards? Well, the experience of being there, my daily life, right, was uniquely different in the sense that, um, and what I learned through my own experience and observation was the value of self having uh, having the common good be much more important than your own greed and self interest. You know, for example, within villages. If you were an adult and there were little kids, it didn't necessarily have to be your kids, but you still looked out for them. Uh, so, you know, it kind of fits in that thing of it takes a village to raise a child and that kind of stuff. But I think essentially what, what I came out with is I was able to be at least conscious of the fact that it's possible in the experience of being alive to be aware of things that a lot of people may not be aware of. And I experienced certain specific things, like for example, I came down with mononucleosis and I was in the hospital, and Dr. Ward was treating me. And one of the guys, a young guy who was a teacher in public schools, wound up in the hospital next to me. It's like the, 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 the men's ward was like an old concert hut, and intensive care was like right in front of the desk for the nurse. <laughs> so the two of us were fairly close to each other. This poor guy was dying. They'd already taken him to Guam, to the naval hospital, and they said, no, we can't cure him. And they diagnosed him as having pneumonia. And when he wound up in the bed next to me, when I looked over, he, his, he looked like he'd been inflated like a balloon. I mean, his everything, his face, his neck, his arms, his legs, were completely swollen up, just with, I don't know, some kind of fluid. So... Then what they did, which I learned was kind of standard procedure, the medical doctors on, on uh, Guam have said that, no, the guy cannot survive. He's not going to live. We're going to need to send him home. Of course, when he gets home, he's going to need to have the priest come and give him less rights, which that, that happened. I'm, I'm watching this young guy passing away next to me. I watched the priest give him the last rights. The priest leaves. The person who comes in is a woman. I'm trying to remember the title but it's like a healer with local medicine. She cured him. Now, you would not ever experience that. I can't imagine experiencing that in this country, but it was my own personal experience there. So what is it that is real, that is real there, and other people may not be aware of it? I mean, if you see something, and it's not like somebody's practicing magic, it's not that. I mean, it's like a consciousness that I think I think that's so important to me that my experience there allowed me to realize <clears throat> that in my own life, <clears throat> I have the opportunity, if I'm willing to make the effort, to become more conscious instead of less conscious. You know, so many people get stuck. Um, by the time, like I've worked with different consultants dealing with education for people and for Native Americans and stuff, and I've worked with one person, she said, Don, you need to realize that the average person, by the time they hit their late 30s, pretty much are in the site, there's nothing more for them to learn. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, is that we may, we may have an opportunity to see some small part of reality, but it's hard for me, I mean, I have <clears throat> wilderness land here, where I have an off-the-grid cabin, and I love being out in the wilderness, and uh, where it's just nature and the idea that human beings would be able to come up with something that unique and interesting there has to be a higher intelligence that that uh, we have an opportunity to become more aware of but oftentimes we don't you know again so many people's lives are taken over by greed and self-interest at the expense of the common good including their own good incidentally <laughs> Because we all, you know, have the same thing as human beings. You know, we have whatever we have to be able to experience what it means to be alive. That, that you know, you just kind of 
does your soul or your heart become this black hole because of your hatred for others? Uh, you know, I, I, I investigated a thing about propaganda that I think is valid. It says that the way it works is that you know how to manipulate people's fear. There's something they're all, everyone's afraid of. And when you do that, it's like a Bunsen burner generating heat under a, under a, uh, a beaker, like a chemistry lab. So the heat from the Bunsen burner is anger. The boiling water created by the heat, by the anger, I'm sorry, but no, fear, I'm sorry, I've got it that one. Sorry. It's fear that you're using to, to generate the heat that causes the water to boil. The boiling water is anger. And then you distill the, the fumes or the steam from that into a test tube. So the fear is used, you, you encourage people, you cause them to become more and more fearful, which causes them to become more angry. And then that anger turns into hatred of others. And, and I think that that's, that has been normal, but it shouldn't be. I, I don't think we need to return to what used to be normal. We need to realize that, that uh, the health of the world, the, the health of, of the future, the health of our children, and all other living things means that this is a time where it may be rather scary, but it provides an opportunity to become so much healthier as a world, as a, as a part of God's creation. I don't know. <laughs> you know, again, it's that thing of greed and self-interest to describe what's the common good. What is the common good? The common good is, you know, the value of all living things that was created by a higher intelligence. And I feel that, like, if I had not been on site now, I would have had less of a chance to, to experience some of that. So that experience for me is so valuable because it's allowed me to do all the other things that I feel were important in my life. I feel very fortunate that I had that experience when I was young. Well, thank you so much for yeah. your time today yeah. and for sharing stories with us. Yeah. Any final thoughts before we go? You know, this is wonderful. That's the first time I've really discovered that, hey, I can actually have a real conversation with you and you're, you're on site panel and I'm here. And I've always wanted to have a chance to go back again. But this also, I mean, this is really nice. I mean, it's so nice for me to be able to maintain a real personal contact with people from Saipan. And you've shown me that people have not changed, <laughs> which is really good. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Hope that you continue to do well there in New Mexico. And, you know, if there's anyone, anyone who would like to have a conversation like we have with me, I'm more than... Our guest today has been John Whitbeck, a Peace Corps volunteer who served in Saipan from 1968 to 1970. We've chatted with him via WhatsApp today and thank him for making time to join us. And uh, if you would like to hear more Your Humanities Half Hour, please subscribe to our YouTube channel at Northern Marianas Humanities Council. And if you'd like to get in touch with John, or a uh, comment on today's show, please contact us on Facebook at 670 Humanities. Hope you all are doing well and take care of yourselves. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Mm -hmm.